when we think about the word hope, uh, sometimes in our English language, this is one of those words that kind of feels hollow at times or, or maybe even a little bit weak at times. There are, uh, I think there, there are three significant lesser forms of hope that we tend to give ourselves over to and we tend to think about when we consider the concept of hope. Uh, one is kind of uh, what, what I call hometown team hope. It's the, it's the hometown team hope, it's the, it's the cross your fingers kind of hope, you want this to work out, you really want your team to win, and, 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 and so what you do is you go, I, I want it to happen, so I'm going to put all the really good vibes out there that I possibly can, because that's going to do something, that's, uh, that's definitely going to accomplish something for you. I, I will tell you this, um, I, I am, I'm a big football fan, I love the NFL, and I love, I love Houston, I consider Houston my hometown. So I'm, I'm really excited today, like my football team, I'm going, all right, man, I, I hope my team gets to win today. This would be really cool. But I will tell you, being a Houston fan too, I'm also used to going, I, I have all this hope at the beginning of the season. And then three weeks in going, I have all this hope in the NFL draft coming up. <laughs> like, what is this going to be? This is, uh, I, now this year's supposed to be different, right? Like this, all, everybody's saying this year is going to be really different. I I can't really just go there because of my Houston experience. I'm not going to be like, this is our year, and then it gets washed away. I'm not a Cowboys fan, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> let's just be real about something right here. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so, so the point of this is your hometown team hope. This is hope that hinges on a maybe. Right? It, it, it hope, it's hope that hinges on, on a, the best thing's a possibility. It might be our time. It might work out. If we cross our fingers, we hope hard enough and, and we want it well enough, maybe we'll see that come happen. Or, or if you're used to rejection, you go, I'm going to hedge my bets here, and I have reason to hope, but I, I want to be realistic because I really don't want a letdown. So hometown teen hope doesn't really do much for us. And there's, there's the I can breathe hope. I can breathe hope. This is finally we got some good news. Finally there's, there's something. Uh, I've been holding my breath and I didn't realize how extremely anxious I have been over a course of time. And now all of a sudden uh, the diagnosis comes. And it's a rough one. And it's really difficult. And, 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 and you don't know what you're going to do. And, and usually when the diagnosis comes there's long periods of time Weeks, months, eternities, it feels like. Until finally, there's a response, that there's, a, there's a procedure that you could do. There's, there's, there's a remedy. There's, there's something that could solve these things. And you, so you go, okay, okay, finally, there's reason to hope. There's something that we can look forward to. And this is a hope that's based on, on probability. It says, well, we're not out of the woods yet, but we can see, like, there could be something really good coming. And this could be really powerful hope. But it's still at best anchored in possibility or, or maybe even probability. But anything other than certain. And then there's, well, there's, there's, there's what I've been calling Star Wars hope. Star Wars hope is the, uh, all right, so think about the original Star Wars movie, or even, even, even better, think about Rogue One. If you've seen Rogue One, it's an eight years old movie, so I, like, I'm going to talk about the end of it, but it's been out for eight years. I, I, it, it's, I don't need to give a spoiler alert for an eight-year-old movie, right? Well, some people are looking at me with daggers. All right, let's see, let's see how this goes. So Rogue One comes, and it's the one that sets up the original Star Wars movie, and the very end of it, very end of it all, the plans to the Death Star are making their way to the Rebel ship, and they're going through, and people are just being decimated left and right while they're taking this desk, trying to get it, trying to get it wherever it needs to go. It finally ends up in the hands of Leia, and the person who gives it to her looks at it and says, what is this? Like, well, what, did he, what, what, what did we even give you that was worth all of this stuff? And she looks, and she smiles, and she says, it's hope. And then you go, but is it? Because I know how the original movie starts, and your ship is captured by Darth Vader, and everybody is just done, and you have to eject this stuff to some random desert planet where some uh, wild farm boy comes up, and he finds out he can become a space wizard if he really tries hard, and all of a sudden, like, this kid is the next hope. And uh, maybe that works out. And then you go, does it? Because then there are sequel trilogies that come, and then he becomes an issue, and then there's another bad guy, so there's another good guy who comes up, and now somebody else is, I guess, the hope, or not 
God, even if she calls herself Skywalker, she's not. It's ridiculous. It's a, I, can, I can rant on these things for a while. Star Wars hope is a, it's a, whoo, boy. This is a hope that's just based on we believe this could work, and if it does, the best thing it's going to buy us is a temporary hope. That eventually, eventually, time moves, people change, systems adapt, and suddenly we're in need for new hope again. I tell you this, there are going to be a lot of people who show up to vote in early November with Star Wars hope in their mind. And they're going to say, oh, if only my person wins. If only she could win, or if only he could win. And what's going to happen is one of them is going to win. And whoever voted for the person who ends up winning, is they're going to say, ah, their things can be so much better for four more years. And then the other group is going to say, these things are going to be terrible. This is, this is going to be awful for four years. So, so in this version of, of hope, if we can call it that, the best bet is it's temporary. And, and, and the best version of reality is that someone else's hope is someone else's despair. And whatever it is that we walk into in November, we're going to see half of our country feeling great hope and half of our country being in ultimately despair which means it can't really be hope. It's important to, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to hope in the person you, you get behind and you want to vote for, and, and, and it's, it's, it's good to do. But our hope is Jesus. There is no one else, no one else who offers assurance of hope like this. This hope is just, in English, it's, it's, it's a weak word. It's good luck. It's probability. It's temporary. And I would just tell you, if this view of hope that we often talk about in the English language, if this was the kind of hope that the Bible talked about, I could not be a Christian. I, 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 would, I would not be able to stomach following a God and saying, well, maybe this will work out. Or, well, maybe, maybe he actually is who he says he is. But maybe not. Because other people say things and they walk away. Or, he's good. And he's so good. And he's only good for a little while. And then eventually that runs out. All of these things aren't hope. And none of these things are the things that are conveyed in the biblical view of hope. None of this. It's, it's, it's so much better than this. We have so much reason to have confidence in hope. Tim Keller puts it this way. Uh, he says this. Uh, the New Testament uses the word hope in two different ways. When it comes to hoping in human beings and ourselves, our hope is always relative, uncertain. But when the object of hope is not any human agent but God, then hope means confidence, certainty, and full assurance. To have hope in God is not to have an uncertain, anxious wish that he will affirm your plan or recognize, uh, uh, but, but to recognize that he and he alone is trustworthy and everything else will let you down and that his plan is infinitely wise and good. If I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, that confirms that there is a God who is both good and powerful, who brings light out of darkness, and who is patiently working out a plan for his glory, our good, and the good of the world. Christian hope means I, that I stop betting my life and happiness on human agency and rest in him. This is our God who's worth following. This is our God who's worth putting our entire lives into. It's not possibility. When we find hope in scripture, any time it's connected with who God is, it is certainty. It is confidence. And the Hebrews 11, verse 1 tells us this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. There's a sure and certain hope we have in who God is. And scripture tells us 
hope positively, confidently, with certainty. This was what we see in Abraham. We also see that Abraham, well, it wasn't always like this for him, which is good because hope is for people who have none. This is one of the things we find to be so true in Scripture. That's the story of Abraham, being someone who didn't have any hope. It was ten generations from the flood, from Noah, until the time that God spoke to Abraham. And during those ten generations, we have no biblical evidence that God spoke to anyone. I I look at that with some certainty and I go, I'm sure that he did. But it never made scripture, which means it didn't make the level of impact that it had been for ten generations until God spoke to Abram In Genesis chapter 12, here's verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. What kind of offer is this? Ten ten generations of, of silence, and all of a sudden this voice speaks. And I tell you, 10 generations of, of silence and of waiting and of hoping and of, and, and of longing and of, and of recounting the stories of old and hearing of people uh, who, who had walked with the Lord before and going, well, what is this that's happening? And then all of a sudden God speaks. This is an offer that is too good to pass up on. Go, leave. Now, it's risky. There's certainly risk involved with that. Leave your hometown. Leave your home family. Take only what is immediately yours. Go and follow me to some unknown, unnamed land. You'll know it when you see it. I'll tell you it's there. There, When you show up, it's not going to be easy for you, but go follow me. I'm going to turn you into a massive nation. And all the peoples of the world will be blessed because of you. It's absolutely risky. But could you imagine the reverse of this story? Imagine, well, imagine how short Tolkien's stories would be if it started with a hobbit who loved to not travel, loved, liked to be in his home and be secure in his own things, and all of a sudden this random wizard comes by the door and says, hey, I have an adventure for you. And he says, no, thank you. I'm good here. Slam. The end. Done. <laughs> The Lord is inviting you to follow him with all of your life. It is the grandest adventure you can do to move out of comfort, to move out of what feels like security, and to step into risk of the God who gives us sure hope, confident hope. Everything else will let you down. But this is what the Lord calls this is, what he, this is what he offers to you and to me through Jesus. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24 say this. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. So hope is for people who have none because Hope is a free gift of grace. Hope came to Abraham when he certainly didn't have hope to become what he became and to see what he saw and to do the things that he did and to walk in close relationship with the Lord. Hope came to Abraham and said, follow me. And Abraham believed in the power of this free gift. And it's... And it's free, and it's not something that he earned. It's not something that you and I earn. Like This is what Paul, when he wrote down Romans, was talking about here. And this is what Jamie read for us earlier. Verse 17 says, We call Abraham father not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. He had done nothing to earn or deserve this. God simply called him. And he believed in the word that God spoke. 
And he didn't show it by a big test. He just went, okay, I believe you. I'm going to go. And he moves on. He says, isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life where the word makes something out of nothing. Abraham's dream of having children was already at this time as good as dead. He was 75 years old. so I was beyond the birthing age. There were all these logical reasons to look at this and say, no, there is no hope. Ah, sometimes the most powerful things we can do in life is to simply believe God's word. The most powerful form of hope is often begun in just saying, God, I, I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe you keep your promises. And so I need this hope. It's good news. This hope is also for people who used to have it. People who look back at their past and remember what it is to have walked with the Lord. People used to have it will we'll look at this and, and they'll say, I, I, I used to see this. When I was in college, man, I had a group that would meet over in my dorm, in my house all the time. We would come and we would challenge each other with scriptures. And then I graduated and I moved out of that. And, and that just kind of, I don't know, I haven't been able to connect with people like that anymore. But I used to do these things. I used to lead. I, I used to really wrestle with faith in a serious way. And then, well, I don't know what happened. Life just kind of happened. And eventually, well, eventually things got hard. I didn't know marriage was going to be as complicated as it became. No one ever told me it was going to be this difficult to have kids and see them grow up and make choices that quite frankly hurt. I didn't know the relationships that I thought were going to last were going to be ones that ended up bringing significant pain. I, I remember when I used to have hope and it felt good and it felt right. And now, well, hope is for people who used to have it. There is no doubt against that. See, we see this with Abraham. We see this with Abraham and, and, and the way that he followed after all of this longing. Because it, it wasn't that long after Abraham followed the Lord, went to a new spot, and, and Abram and Sarai waited a, you know, a year, a couple years, just taking some time. Hey, this child that you promised is... Uh, Sure, slow in showing up. And the people that we've talked to about this, they all say we're crazy for believing that this is possible because, I mean, they just look at us. <laughs> and we're starting to feel that way too. We're starting to feel that way too. And so, Abram was told to come and count the stars if you can. Count the grains of sand. And as you do, know that you are counting little hearts and little hands who will come from your family tree and bless the entire world. And Abram hoped to the point where he and Sarai had their name changed to Abraham and Sarah. Romans 4.18 says this, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He, he had hope in the Lord against the hope that he had in his own fallen state. The hope in the Lord against the hope that he just didn't have in his own physical status anymore. There was no means and so he placed his hope in the Lord even though he wavered in the middle of this. And we know one of the things that he ended up doing is 
Well, he and, and Sarai, this was actually before the name change. They, they looked at the ways that God meant this, and, and then Sarai came up with the idea and said, look, are we sure that he meant this in a literal kind of a way? Maybe, maybe you are supposed to be father, and I'm kind of like mother, like, a, like in a spiritual sense, like a big old metaphor, because you can have kids with other people. And at the time, it was culturally acceptable for someone, if, if you had a servant, and they were willing to have a child with them, it, it offered them a future and a hope and a security in ways that nothing else in their life had done that before. And for Sarah, she said, well, maybe, maybe this will work. And Abraham goes, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe this will be it. And so then Ishmael was born of Abraham through Hagar, his servant. And Abraham loved Ishmael. Even though, even though it was out of wavering that he came Abraham loved him to the point that he brought Ishmael to the Lord in, in Genesis 17, 18 through 19. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And this is why I say, if, if there was any sort of lesser hope, was the best type of hope we could find in the Lord, I could not follow him. Because if, if the Lord said, yeah, you know what? I'll take your, your mistake that you made, and, and I'm gonna turn that into a blessing. I'm gonna take the lemons, make them lemonade. I'm gonna take whatever this was, and I'll turn this for good, which the Lord does, thank God. But here, what we have right here is, 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 is no... Abraham, what I told you is what I told you. And if I'm going to go back on that, then all of a sudden that means that, that my words don't exist for all time, that the things that I share aren't true in all circumstances. Abraham, I told you, you and Sarah, it's you and Sarah. You're going to name that son Isaac. I will extend the covenant through him. Because my word will not waver. Here is the assurance of hope that we have in the Lord. He is one who will not let his word waver. No matter the wait, no matter how long, hope grows in the waiting. And it thrives in barren places. Sometimes the waiting is agony. And sometimes the waiting is incubation. A waiting for God to do what he is doing already. And I could talk about this for a while, but, but I, I want you to see this video testimony from Christy Robbins. She's a, a part of our church. And she knows something about what it means to wait and to look and to see the Lord at work. Let's watch this together. My name is Christy Robbins, and this is my story of hope. I have three children, and um, my son Britt is the youngest, and um, when he was 13, he was caught uh, smoking marijuana. I was, of course, you know, very upset as a parent. As a mother, you would do anything for your child. And I grew up in a uh, very dysfunctional family. My, my brother was a drug addict, and so my childhood was hard. And I was so determined that I would do everything right as a mother. And this would not happen to my child. I was determined to fix it. Of course, he was in trouble, he was grounded, and I would go out on the street and try to find the drug dealers and confront them and threaten them. I went out and I grabbed one around his, his shirt, got in his face, and I threatened him, and he was just a kid, you know, just a teenager. And I remember all of that was popping off his shirt. So I was that strong. And I told him if he ever sold drugs to my kid, I would find him and I would kill him. 
and it was in the street, and a neighbor came out, and she said, well, ma'am, you're, you can't, you know, you're hurting him. And my son told me, Mom, Mom, you can't do that. We're going to have a drive-by at our house. And I said, well, if we have a drive-by at our house, they better kill me with the first bullet because I'm going to pull the bumper off the car and beat him to death. That's how consumed I was with not letting this happen. And that's when I realized I, I was losing control, and I was no longer in control. I became very, very depressed, and um, I was suicidal at one point, and I had a plan. And thank goodness that um, God intervened and sent me a dream that somebody pulled me out of the water and saved me, and I was on a respirator because I was had brain injury, and I thought, I can't, I can't do that. So um, I did seek out help, get therapy, and uh, for myself, uh, I looked into programs for my son, but the addiction kept on and it worsened. Uh, my son became a nurse. I thought he was doing better. Um, drug addicts are really good at, at hiding things, and even though I was a nurse, I really believed that he was doing better, and he overdosed at work. Um, he injected uh, medicine to his vein, and he coded, and um, he was in ICU. And I was so angry and, and upset that it took three days for me to go and see him in ICU. And when I did, I sat beside the bed, and, and he was awake at that time. He had been on a ventilator, and I said, Brent, I need to know what kind of funeral you want because I know that you're going to die and I just have to accept that. I said in my mind, I put you in a blanket and I handed you to God. <laughs> that gave me comfort just to wrap him in a blanket and I gave him up to God. A couple of years after that, he, he wanted to save his license and so the nursing program has a, they have a program for addiction and alcoholism, and he was in that program. And I would pray, God, God, please, please don't let him lose his license. If he loses his license, what is he going to do? He'll, he'll be on the street. But he made it through the program. He moved to Dallas, and he started working there with, with recovering addicts and recovering alcoholics and created a music therapy group. And he was so loved and so, he made such a difference uh, in so many people's lives. But he came down to visit and we were eating at a local restaurant here in College Station. And he got up and he followed the waiter into the restroom. And he came back and I said, Brent, what, what's, what's wrong, what's going on? And he said, Mom, the server was addicted to meth and cocaine and that he could tell by looking at him, he can tell, and that he gave him his phone number and offered help. And that's just Brent, that's what he does. So he, anywhere, anytime, he is there to help. He gives all of his recovery to God. He's been sober now, clean for 10 years. Uh, he has his master's degree. I'm so proud of him. I love him so much. I realize now that that was God's plan all along, and I couldn't see it. And to break the cycle of addiction is so hard, but I never gave up hope, and I never gave up prayer, and I never gave up on God. There's always another way. There's always another way. You can't see it right now but there's help and there's hope. God does have a plan. I truly believe that. Then that's my story of hope. Lamentations, um, one of the books in the Bible that you would not expect to find much hope from. It's literally named after lament. And so the author gives all the reasons he has for lamenting and all the reasons he has for anguish and, and bitterness. And I tell you this, when something like that makes the Bible, this tells us it is worth taking 
all of our anguish and wrestling with that with the Lord, not hiding about it, not pulling someone else aside going, isn't this awful, isn't this, that can be one thing, but, but doing this with God, this is, this is what the Lord desires, this is what he honors. And then right after a, a whole list, Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 25 say this. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. At one point, there's a moment in Scripture. You can read this in Luke 7. John the Baptist, the person who baptized Jesus, Jesus' cousin, who was convinced in Jesus' messiahship. At this point, he's put in prison. And he's there. And he wavers. He wants Jesus to hurry up. Come on. Can you get going on this? Or, or when are you going to kick the Romans out? When are you going to take care of all of the badness and of all of the evil and, 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 and just bring, bring your kingdom fully on earth? So he sends messengers. Would you go ask Jesus, are you the one who is coming or are we supposed to wait for another? And Jesus receives the messengers and and Jesus sends him back. And he says, all right, go, go back and tell John, yes. Actually, go back and tell John what, what you see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have good news preached to them. And you can, you can just picture the messengers coming back, right back to John's prison cell. And they're going through all of these things. And John sees this and he knows this is straight out of Isaiah. This is a checklist. This is what the Messiah has come to do. And then he keeps going and going. And he's waiting for that line. And the prisoners are set free. And the prisoners are set free. Because he knows he's got to be believing this at this point. As soon as that is said, this jail is going to come open. He's going to march out. No one's going to be able to stop him. And they finish the list. The poor have good news preached to them. And John says, was there anything else? Was there, was, was there not one more thing? And, and they go, yeah, yeah, there was actually. We forgot about this. There was. Yeah, what did he say? What did he say? He said, and blessed is the one who is not offended on my account. And John and that moment was taken aback. And he was told, yes, I am the one that you can hope in. Yes, I am the one who is worthy of your hope. And yes, hope is greater than any circumstance you are in. And yes, John, you are still going to have to wait. And John knew at that moment he was not gonna walk out of prison. but it was filled with this hope of confidence as Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that he held on to his faith, that he was able to witness to the people around him, that he was able to make a proclamation for God, and, and yes, it called his life for it. And he was ready, because God is worthy, and he is worth the wait. What about you? How is it? How, how do you wait upon the Lord? If it's with anxiety, well, there are a lot of people who did that when, in Scripture. If it's in worry and fear, there are a lot of people who did that in Scripture. And they brought those anxious thoughts and the worries directly to the Lord. And the Lord hears and he sits and he gives good reason for great confidence in who he is. Because here's how we're called to wait. Confidently. He is a sure hope. And he is for you. Oh, pray with me. God, 
We desire to see you anew in our lives. And part of it is just because we can recognize we need hope. And whenever we say this, what we're really saying is, Lord, we need you. And we want the day to come that you come back and you restore this earth. You bring this new creation here and you get rid of all evil, of all badness. That there is no more sickness, no more dying, no more, no more tears. You're going to come back and wipe away every single one that we have. And you're going to set this right. And we just long sometimes for this day. We ache for this day. So Lord, would you come? Would you build up in us a, a, a longing and a desire for your arrival? Draw up in us spirits of worship. Your spirit, God, pour out your Holy Spirit that we may worship you here as we go forward, wherever it is that we're gonna be, that we would be entirely unsatisfied in anyone other than you and that we would not pick up lesser hopes but instead that we would look to you in certainty however long we wait. You are in the waiting. So whatever it is that you are doing in this time right now, Lord, we invite you to do it. We give ourselves to you. We surrender to you. And we proclaim your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As we get ready to close with one final...